Hi guys, it's Julia here and I'm going to be talking about what to expect in labor. So first, I just want to take a moment and just try to imagine what your plans are for your birth. Um, like, have you made any plans? And if you haven't, that's fine. But try to think about maybe what your expectations are of what your birth is going to look like. So maybe just pause the video for a minute and take out a piece of paper and kind of write all of that down. And when you're ready, um, just rip it all up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't rip it up. But the reason why I bring it up is because birth does have this way kind of humbling us when it comes to preparing and planning. And I'm not saying don't plan, but let's consider kind of like what does healthy, how do we set healthy expectations for birth? And part of it is learning about all the different possibilities that could happen during birth, um, both medical and non-medical, which is what you guys are doing right now. So that's awesome. Also, just to consider like this loose plan um, while you're also remaining open to the process as it unfolds. It's also really important when you plan to have a support system that centers you and your preferences. Uh, so that's both your partner, your family, whoever's going to be at the birth, your provider, um, people that can support your decisions. Another important thing is to avoid kind of comparing your birth to other people. I have, I say this all the time, but I've seen a lot of births and they're never the same and no birthing person is the same and no birth is, it's all different. Um... And then after the birth, kind of give yourself some time to process what parts of your labor kind of met your need, met your hopes and met your expectations and which fell short of them. Or maybe there were some that just like went above and beyond. So just giving yourself that space to process. Um, so I like to say it's important to be informed and flexible because oftentimes birth trauma can come from a feeling of being out of control. So when you're informed, you're able to make decisions that make you feel in control, even when things are outside of your control. So kind of changing, changing topics a little bit. This is a huge slide on all the ways that your body is preparing for birth. And I'm just going to focus on a few. You can see that... Um, you might have more pressure on your bladder as the baby drops lower. Uh, you might be getting more clear discharge, diarrhea, cramping, backache, kind of feelings like you are when you're on your period. Um, and then there's the signs of labor. So one of the big ones is bloody show. Bloody show, I've had it described to me, someone described it, it was like a slug, a bloody slug. Um, but if you don't want that visual, it's, it just looks like bloody mucus and it doesn't mean that you're in labor, but it's a good indication that you're probably days or weeks or hours away from when your labor is beginning. And, um, another big sign is obviously contractions. So just imagine that you're at home and you start noticing this cramping and you're thinking, okay, am I in labor? And you're feeling all excited. My recommendation is to try to ignore those cramps for as long as possible, because that's why you hear people having these days long labor, is when you start to really focus on them, at the beginning, you can become really tired by the end. So maybe go for a walk, you could bake something, you could watch a movie, whatever you can do to get your mind off it, because don't worry, when you're in labor, you're going to know that you're in labor. So when your contractions are long and strong, you can't ignore them, then call your provider and just check in with them and let them know what's going on. And they're going to be able to tell you the best time to come to the hospital. So what's happening while you're having these contractions that are, um, that's kind of like a pre-labor time, is you're starting to dilate and efface. So the goal of labor is to get to 10 centimeters dilated. You can see that in this far right picture. This um, person is 10 centimeters dilated and they're 100% effaced. 
that means that there's 10 centimeters um, for the baby to come out a of the cervix they've opened the cervix is open to 10 centimeters and you can see effacement is the th stretching and thinning of the cervix so here you can see um, the cervix is 0% effaced and here it's 100% because it thinned out here it's 60 so that so um, that is important information for your cervical uh, exam and so imagine you go into the hospital they're gonna say okay we're gonna check you to see how dilated and effaced you are so this is a good chart you can see maybe they check you and they say you're two centimeters so you know that your cervix has dilated to maybe the size of a cherry at the end it will be the size of a bagel and they're, they might say, okay, you're four centimeters dilated and you're 70% effaced and the baby is at a negative one station. And when they say station, they're talking about how, how, um, how low or how engaged the baby is in the pelvis. Um, so they're going to give you those three pieces of information. It's good to know what they're talking about. It's also good to know that you are able to say yes or no to getting... Uh, cervical check it can be really helpful to have information about the progress of labor but it's important to know that they don't predict how labor can progress so uh, oftentimes people will say okay so I'm five centimeters dilated and I'm 80 percent of face that means I'm halfway through and I'm gonna give birth it's been four hours since I've been in labor so it's gonna be four more hours till I give birth no that is not how birth works you can go from being seven centimeters to being 10 centimeters in an hour you can you know it's just it's not a linear process and so sometimes it can get really discouraging if you feel like you're working really hard and the cervical checks are telling you that you're you know only three centimeters dilated so just keep that in mind it can be a mental game and you're allowed to say um you know can you ask for consent every time you want to check me and i will consider it so here is like kind of the baby's perspective of what's going on. You can see pre-labor. Do you see the um, cervix isn't dilated? You're not effaced. And then early labor, things start to open up. Active labor, things start getting really intense. You might really need to be using your coping strategies, using different positions. Transition is a big one. This is when Oftentimes you're going to feel like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I Sometimes people feel like they're just done. They feel like it's their comfort coping mechanisms they were using before weren't working. You might throw up. Um, just remember when that happens, when you're like, okay, I can't do this anymore. You might be in tr transition, which means you might be between 7 and 10 centimeters, which means you might be really close to having your baby. So if you can get through that, you'll get to the pushing and descent. You see the baby rotates. Um, and um, then the baby's born. Uh, pushing can take, for first time moms, uh, especially first time moms with an epidural, can take a while, can take like two hours. So oftentimes I see everyone get really excited and be like, okay, you're 10 centimeters, you're 100% effaced. It's time to start pushing, you're gonna meet your baby. But remember that Yes, it's amazing and celebrate that, but you still have um, kind of another journey with the pushing phase and then a, another journey after the birth phase. So it's, it's, a, it's a long, birth is a long walk. So what, um, when is your water break? Which of those stages we just talked about? It depends. It can happen at any time. Um, the nurse might, or the doctor midwife might offer you to break your water that can speed things up in terms of your, it can make your labor more intense and it can also make your labor more painful because it is more intense. There's less, there's no cushion between your cervix and the baby's head. So kind of, I would, I recommend to everyone just be aware that that will probably be offered to you and you can um, be informed to make a decision that works for you when that happens. Um, how does the baby fit through such a tight space? It always shocks me that it does, but the baby's rotating. Um, so it's like a jigsaw puzzle type of thing where the baby's like rotating in your pelvis. 
and also the newborn has these soft and flexible skull bones that can even like overlap to help the head fit through. If your baby isn't head down, it might be um, presenting with their butt down, with, which is a breach, or their head, or their, um, yeah, they could, they could be in all sorts of different positions. Your provider may or may not know until that happens, and they will help you navigate that. I know that's not a great answer, but um, just know that that is a possibility. Typically, your head, your baby's head, um, is, should be face down with their back along your belly, and they're facing your spine. So that's a great position to have a baby in. If your baby is facing the other way, that um, can be called OP. Um, you can also call that sunny side up. That means that their head is down, but their face is facing your, uh, like your belly, and they're spine is along your spine. So that can be really painful and a sign of that can be that you're having a lot of pain. You're feeling your contractions in your back. Um, a great thing to do when that's happening is to get on your hands and knees uh, and labor on hands and knees. Okay, so here's a list of uh, different medical interventions that can happen during your birth. You might recognize some of them. There's a lot of uh, information on this slide, I'm going to focus first on the, elect the external electric fetal monitor. Uh, so that is a device that goes on your belly and it's measuring your contraction patterns and the baby's heart rate. So that's this is a commonly used in the hospital. If you go to the hospital, you will be offered this. Just know that you can ask for alternative ways to monitor the baby if Sometimes they can get in the way of doing certain positions or if you feel it's uncomfortable. Sometimes they have portable ones or just ask what your options are. Um, that's a huge theme in birth is being like, oh, this is this necessary or what are my options? Um, another good question to ask is like, is this an emergency or do I have time to think about it? You know, like they have their protocols, but you can always just ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. Are there other ways to do it? Um, this is an epidural. So if you decide to get epidural, this is what it looks like when the anesthesiologist is, <clears throat> they're going to have you lean forward with a pillow on your lap and they're going to put the needle in your spine and you will be asked to remain very still. This is a forcep delivery. Um, so sometimes the provider might need help um, and they might need like a tool to help you push your baby out, I guess is a better way to say it. And that is using these kind of tongue shaped um, tools to uh, help your baby come out. Another option is the vacuum, which is more common than forceps, but if the baby has a lot of hair or there's a positioning issue, then um, forceps are used. So the vacuum attaches to the top of the baby's head and uh, as you push, will suction the baby out. This is a cesarean or an abdominal birth. Um, oftentimes your partner can be in the room and there's a big sheet that blocks what's going on. Yeah, so those are just some different interventions and I would recommend on your own time to just kind of investigate all those different possibilities that could happen during birth. Here are some examples of comfort measures that really can help during the active and um, the, any part of labor. Affirmations, visualizing positive images. Some people like visualizing the ocean. That's a very cliche one that people really love. Uh, you can make a playlist, relaxing music, clothes that feel comfortable if you don't want to be in a gown. Um, it's really a huge part about labor is feeling safe and comfortable. And so imagine like, how can you create that space for you? And your preferences can change during, throughout labor. One minute you might love the music and the next minute you might be like, turn it off, please. And that is okay. And that is part of the partner's role is to really be staying calm. Um, try not to interrupt her. Try not to, um, tell her what her preferences are, but kind of offering different options, um, kind of following her lead, um, reminding her to rest. You can wipe her forehead with a cool washcloth. 
I really like this whole list. And so I would recommend if your partner isn't here to take a screenshot and read it out loud to them. Um, yeah, and remind them that you might not be like ha like cheery and jokey during labor. It might because you're going to be working hard. And so, yeah, just kind of like setting their, helping them set their expectations too. Here are some different positions that I really enjoy uh, offering people during labor as a doula. This is a peanut ball. It can uh, really help the baby get into a great position for birth. Um, and so you can ask your nurse, if you don't have a doula, you can ask them to help you with the peanut ball and they should... They should have one there. Um, that can be really helpful. This is counter pressure. You see the support person is pushing on their back. That can be feel really good. This person is on a hands and knees. This person sitting on the toilet. It's funny, sitting on the toilet is a great way to kind of relax because you're used to kind of opening and like, yeah, your body just knows what to do on the toilet in terms of opening and moving things downward. So I recommend doing a few contractions on the toilet or more than that. And then here's a birth ball. They should have these in the hospital too. Okay, so when you're 10 centimeters and 100% faced and the baby, then you're ready to push. So you can see the baby rotating here. Um, you might feel like you have to poop. That's a sign that you're ready to push. And then you will do skin to skin, which um, can really release hormones that help uh, cause the uterus to kind of contract and stop bleeding. It also stabilizes the baby's heartbeat, temperature, and breathing, and releases really great hormones for you. So people really talk about this as a really wonderful time to be bonding with your baby. Then your placenta will be born. Um, that can often be uncomfortable and crampy, but you're gonna have your baby most likely on your chest, and so you'll be distracted, or if your baby needs medical attention, they'll go on the warmer. And um, yeah, they might suction the baby's airway, give them a vitamin K injection, uh, do some eye ointment, bathe them, and yeah, you can breast start breastfeeding whenever you're ready. So I hope that was a helpful overview. I know that was a lot of information. Um, but thank you for listening and hope to see you on the next video. Bye guys.